Good evening, and welcome to NTD UK News. I'm Stuart Lees, and here are today's top stories. Damaging memorials or statues could mean 10 years in jail as the government unveils a new law. Nightingale hospitals are set to close from April. And pieces of meteorite from outer space are identified in the Cotswolds, a first for the UK. The government unveils new laws, including up to 10 years in jail for criminally damaging memorials. It comes after people defaced Sir Winston Churchill's statue in protests last year. Here's NTD's Jane Well with the story. Vandals face up to 10 years in prison for criminally damaging memorials. The current maximum penalty is three months. A massive chunk of new crime legislation includes a new law that increases the penalties for people damaging statues and memorials. It follows the toppling of statues last year linked to the slave trade. Activists threw English merchant and philanthropist Edward Colston's statue into the river at a Black Lives Matter march. And the word racist was sprayed on Sir Winston Churchill's statue at an Extinction Rebellion demonstration. A former police chief tells us he welcomes the new, tougher rules. Well, I'm somewhat biased because I'm the fourth generation uh, soldier in my family, as, as well as my brother. So, of course, these uh, war memorials are something I always bow my head when I pass, and that's the... Uh, the uh, respect I hold them in. So, and it's good to see the government actually uh, acting rather than talking about it. Police will also be allowed to restrict protests that disrupt transport links or access to parliament. Human rights group Liberty says giving more power to police to clamp down on protests risks making it harder to hold the powerful to account. The new plans outline longer sentences for a range of crimes, with life sentences for children who commit murder, killer drivers and terrorists. This massive piece of legislation gives more powers to police to stop and search to clamp down on knife crime. It also widens the law that prevents adults in a position of trust from abusing children. Jane Werrell, NTD News, London. Domestic abusers in London will be tracked with GPS tags upon release from prison for the first time. The pilot scheme could be extended nationwide if successful. Up to 200 convicted domestic abusers will be fitted with tags for the police and probation service to monitor their location. If they breach probation conditions or commit a criminal offence, they will face persecution and potential prison sentences. Police can also use the data to verify a victim's account of any reoffending behaviour. London Mayor Sadiq Khan announced the new scheme Tuesday, and the City Hall is investing £260,000 in this one year pilot. City Hall says it builds on a tagging pilot for knife crime offenders, which is monitoring more than 430 people released from prison. The move comes as figures show an increase in domestic abuse over the last year during lockdowns. The NHS says a network of hospitals in England will close from April. These temporary hospitals were set up last spring amid fears of an influx of CCP virus patients. Health Secretary Matt Hancock posted a statement on Twitter saying, We can now stand down our Nightingale hospitals. This is such an important moment in our national recovery. Seven Nightingale hospitals were built in England, and another was set up in Northern Ireland. Scotland and Wales also built their own temporary hospitals. The NHS said they had been on hand as the ultimate insurance policy. But as it turned out, they were largely not needed, because existing hospitals adapted to the situation and increased the number of beds available. The Health Service Journal puts the cost of the Nightingale Hospitals at over £530 million by the end of the 2022 financial year. Retail is showing signs of promise in the UK, as last month's sales increased by 1% against last year. Shoppers anticipated the easing of lockdowns, creating a surge in online shopping. NTD's Patrick Hayden has a look. Total UK retail sales grew 1% last month against the same period the year before. This marks a shift from January where there was a 1.3% year-on-year contraction. The British Retail Consortium, or BRC, along with KPMG, compiled the analysis. 
BRC's chief executive says shoppers were already anticipating the easing of lockdown restrictions. Purchases of school uniforms were one indicator of this. KPMG's head of UK retail, Paul Martin, says even though the government has extended support schemes, high street retailers are going to find it tough. Over the last three months, sales of in-store non-food items dropped by nearly 39%. Martin says that online channels recorded strong sales, with some even getting triple-digit growth. Non-essential stores will be able to reopen on the 12th of April. Patrick Hayden, NTD News. Media regulator Ofcom warned the BBC on Monday that news presenters should not inadvertently give the impression of setting out personal opinions or views on issues of political controversy. The warning is in relation to a Newsnight host's opening monologue after the Prime Minister's chief adviser Dominic Cummins last May. Ofcom said Emily Maitlis's introduction to a story about Cummins' drive to County Durham had the potential to be perceived as her personal view on a major matter relating to current public policy. However, Ofcom will not take action. It wrote that the program on the whole contained an appropriate range of viewpoints. In other news, an NGO director says there's a growing push to closer scrutinize Chinese state-run broadcaster CGTN. This comes after recent decisions by TV regulators in the UK and France. NGD's Joy Duguid has more. UK broadcast regulator Ofcom on Monday imposed fines on Chinese state-run news channel CGTN. £125,000 for its partial coverage of Hong Kong protests and a £100,000 fine for airing a false confession of British national Peter Humphrey. Humphrey has mixed feelings about the rulings. I'm very pleased to see all of these um, disciplinary legal rulings against DGTN. I'm disappointed that the fines are so small. He says fines should be in the millions, since it involves severe and brutal human rights crimes. £100,000 fine something like CGTN is just like spitting in the wind, because CGTN is funded by the very deep and very dirty and very bloody pockets of the Chinese Communist Party. Last week, a French regulator approved CGTN's licence to broadcast in France and by extension in Europe. This comes after Ofcom revoked its UK licence in February, following complaints filed by human rights NGO Safeguard Defenders. Its director says he's not concerned about the French decision. The CSA, as they are called, made it very clear, and this is incredibly unusual, that they will be paying close attention to CGTN and what they broadcast. Uh, so I think it's actually a positive development because it puts more pressure on CGTN. He says it has always been their goal to get TV regulators to better scrutinise Chinese state-owned broadcasters. Peter Darlin is also a victim of a forced confession that was broadcast on Chinese state TV. He says he sees a growing push against Chinese Communist Party or CCP media. And not just in Europe. An Australian broadcaster recently suspended CGTN after receiving a letter from Safeguard Defenders. He says regulations cannot properly deal with the current media landscape anymore. It's, it's a patchwork, really, and there's a lot of ways around these regulations. So for sure, I think, I mean, we're getting to the point where we, we need a reckoning uh, with a more comprehensive overview of how do we combat disinformation, direct lies, biases. He says Safeguard Defenders has some quite exciting developments in the pipeline. Joy Duguid, NTD News. Next time you check out a Google review, think again. A consumer organisation uncovered a booming industry of fake reviews in the UK. The UK Consumer Protection Group, which uncovered that businesses across the UK use fake online reviews on Google. During its investigation, which started a fake company and enlisted the help of a review trading company. It bought 25-star reviews for £108 from one company. These companies can be found easily with a Google search. The watchdog tracked down several accounts, leaving positive reviews at several businesses. Some left unlikely reviews. 
For example, one account around the same time praised a limo service in Surrey, a Glasgow-based gate installation firm, a dentist in Manchester, a paving company in Bournemouth, and a locksmith in Cambridgeshire. Which says Google must clamp down on and prevent these manipulative practices to ensure that consumers can trust the reviews that they read. The Competition and Markets Authority, or CMA, is currently investigating fake reviews. In a first for the UK, pieces of outer space believed to have come from 300 million kilometers away land in a quiet village in the Cotswolds. And Didi's Neil Wardrow speaks with the person who first identified it. The last time a meteorite fell in the UK was 30 years ago, but the rarity of the type of rock makes this one special. It's thought to come from very near Jupiter. Travelling at around 25,000 miles per hour, it landed in the UK just over a week ago. I speak with Dr Richard Greenwood, the person who first identified the meteorite. It all started with a fireball in the sky on the 28th of February. And very importantly, there's now a network of cameras in the UK which are able to track how these fireballs are moving across the sky. And that's what they did. And they were able to work out a trajectory, a path. So this thing was basically alive and glowing for about six to seven seconds. And then it extinguished. And then, of course, it falls to Earth. Dr Greenwood so tells us how much it meant to him to officially identify this discovery. To, to be the person who walked up there and identified it was a, an honour, to be really honest. Um, and uh, I was bowled over. I, 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 it was quite an emotional moment, actually, and uh, I had to be composed in front of these people, but it was a tough thing because it was, you know, wonderful to be the person who could come along and identify that meteorite. These meteorites are known as primitive. Inside, they are made up of tiny particles that date back to beyond the formation of the solar system 4.6 billion years ago. So these are grains which came from the stars that, that lived and died and contributed material from which the solar system itself formed. So we call those pre-solar grains. So this meteorite will tell you about the solar system, about the very earliest part of the solar system. It will also tell you about what went on before the solar system existed. He spoke of a theory about how life on Earth came about. We live on a planet in this inner solar system which is dry, and yet we have life, we have the oceans. And one theory is that it was these our asteroids from the outer solar system which bombarded the early Earth and brought in water and all the building blocks for life. So it's a, a potent theory that life itself on Earth is was formed by just the sort of material that arrived in, in, in Gloucestershire. The meteorite was collected within 12 hours of falling. It hasn't been damaged by the environment. With the many elements and people all working together, Dr Greenwood calls it a brilliant story of cooperation. But also, it is probably one of the most pristine samples of outer space ever collected from the surface of the Earth. Neil Woodrow, NDD News. Up next, drug maker AstraZeneca is trying to calm fears over its vaccine, as some Europeans refuse to take it. That and more when we return. Austrian authorities are blocking a batch of AstraZeneca CCP virus vaccines. They're investigating the doses as a precaution after one person died, another was sickened following inoculation. Authorities are looking for possible connections between the vaccine batch and what happened to the patients. One 49-year-old woman died as a result of severe blood clotting disorders. And another 35-year-old woman developed an acute lung disease but is recovering. Austrian health authorities have not yet found a link between the conditions and the vaccine. Media reports say the women were both nurses working at the clinic that vaccinated them. An AstraZeneca spokesman said the vaccine is safe and thoroughly tested. The company also added it was in contact with Austrian authorities and would fully support the investigation. And this comes as AstraZeneca is working hard to calm fears about side effects from getting its shot. Some people across Europe are reluctant to take up the vaccine. 
Despite multiple scientific studies saying the COVID-19 vaccine manufactured by AstraZeneca is safe and effective, some residents in Europe are turning down that particular shot. They include 60-year-old Nadine Roger, who lives in Paris. She's recovering from breast cancer and is in the higher risk category. She told Reuters, quote, the AstraZeneca shot frightens me and said she's prepared to wait for an alternative dose despite wanting to get vaccinated as soon as possible. The AstraZeneca vaccine requires two doses spaced three months apart. Three months is a very long time, especially after a year of being deprived from going out. So the vaccine is not yet proven against variants. There's too little data on variants. According to the most recent data made available by the French Health Ministry for the end of February, France was only using about a quarter of its AstraZeneca doses, compared with 82% for vaccines made by Pfizer-BioNTech and 37% for the Moderna shot. Partly due to logistical bottlenecks, but also because some French people don't trust the AstraZeneca shot because of concerns over side effects. European regulators have concluded the side effects caused by the AstraZeneca vaccine are not cause to doubt its safety. After initial concerns, France, Germany and Italy have changed tack and are now giving the AstraZeneca vaccine to people over 65. Tens of millions of Americans are now vaccinated for COVID-19. It's progress, but the CDC has received reports of over a thousand people dying after getting the shot. NDD's Miguel Moreno has a story and more on the pandemic. The CDC says they haven't found any patterns in the nearly 1,400 people who've died after getting a COVID-19 mRNA vaccine. It's a nasty number, but the CDC says these deaths make up a 0.0018% of reports related to these vaccines. But we found that this is much more than the 14 deaths reported after taking a flu vaccine during the 2019-2020 influenza season. The CDC estimates that over half of the U.S. population, six months and older, were vaccinated for the flu in that time period. Any medical worker can report adverse effects to this system, the VAR system, but this doesn't mean that the vaccine in question caused it. The White House is urging computer network operators to check if they've been compromised by a recent hack on Microsoft software. It says a recent software patch only protects against future attacks, but it doesn't help if they've already been breached. NTD's Patrick Hayden reports. The White House is raising the alarm over a recent breach in Microsoft's email services. Spokeswoman Jen Psaki said companies should take it very seriously. This is an active threat, uh, and as the National Security Advisor tweeted last night, everyone running these servers, government, private sector, academia, needs to act now to patch them. CNN reported Sunday that President Biden is forming a task force to address the hack. Microsoft and cybersecurity group FireEye says the Chinese regime is behind the attack, but Beijing denies its involvement. The tech company released a patch last week to address flaws in Outlook, its email software, but the remedy can only defend against new hacking attempts. The White House National Security Council tweeted Sunday, patching and mitigation is not remediation. It's essential that any organization with a vulnerable server take measures to determine if they were already targeted. Microsoft initially said the attack was limited, but last week the White House said there was potentially a large number of victims and it's making a whole-of-government response. Microsoft says it's working with the government to guide vulnerable clients as more attacks are expected. Patrick Hayden, NTD News. A U.S. judge delayed the trial of Derek Chauvin on Monday, the police officer charged with George Floyd's death. Jury selection will start today or later. Jury selection was stored because prosecutors asked the judge to add a third-degree murder charge against Derek Chauvin. He's already charged with second-degree murder and manslaughter. In total, they'll choose 12 jurors and up to four alternatives. Meanwhile, hundreds of protesters marched near the trial site early on Monday, saying they want justice for Floyd and for Chauvin to be convicted. The U.S. is strengthening its military presence in the waters of the Indo-Pacific. This is believed to counter communist China's increase in aggression in the region. More by NTD's Don Ma.
The U.S. is proposing a new tactic to deter Chinese aggression in the Indo-Pacific. A new network of missiles would cost close to $30 billion over six years. As per Japan-based newspaper Nikkei, the proposal said the military balance in the Indo-Pacific has become unfavorable for the U.S. It argued that without U.S. deterrence, China will have the courage to take military action in the region. Head of the U.S. Indo-Pacific Command Admiral Philip Davidson warned that the greatest danger the United States faces in the region is the erosion of deterrence to China. He added, quote, We must be doing everything possible to deter conflict. Our number one job out here is to keep the peace, but we absolutely must be prepared to fight and win should competition turn to conflict. The plan comes in light of China's increased military presence in the South China Sea. Beijing claims sovereignty over much of the region and has built artificial islands and military outposts there. It has laid airstrips on them in an effort to strengthen its military capacity. An international tribunal deemed China's sweeping territorial claims unlawful in 2016. The tribunal said that China had violated international law by endangering ships in the area as well as fishing and oil explorations. The proposal comes amid Beijing's plans to ramp up military spending. On Friday, China's Premier Li Keqiang announced a $200 billion investment plan for China's military for 2021. That's around a 7 percent increase from 2020's budget. As for the U.S., Congress approved a total defense budget of $690 billion for fiscal year 2021. Reporting by Don Ma, NTD News. While Britons have to wait until May for cinemas to reopen, New Yorkers can now enjoy blockbusters in theaters. It's the first time in nearly a year. New York City cinemas can only open to 25% capacity with no more than 50 people per screen. Some residents can't wait to book a ticket. Audiences must wear masks and obey social distancing rules and are encouraged to use disinfectant wipes and sanitizers. I'm excited. I decided to not work today and I just came to the theater. As soon as I read that movie theaters were open, I got a ticket literally 10 minutes later. Well, I was walking by and saw the lights on. I had to come in and see. I mean, the beginning of the end. Hey, we're really excited about this. Let's hope it's over. Okay. Studios Walt Disney Co. and Warner Brothers are releasing films directly on online streaming platforms, but some film lovers still prefer cinemas. Uh, I don't subscribe to any streaming services, so and I, I always love to see movies on a big screen with great sound, so it feels so good to be back. Lockdowns hurt cinema operators worldwide, and many chains are struggling to stay afloat. A U.S. media expert says the reopening in New York is an important first step for the future of the cinema industry. And over time, I think we're going to see them really come back to, to prominence, both in terms of the prestige and exclusivity that only a movie theater experience can provide. So I'm very uh, optimistic about the future of the movie theater industry. He says he expects cinemas will recover over time, though streaming will continue to play an important role. That's the news for today. Thanks for tuning in. I'm Stuart Lees.